not. Sweet. All right, good morning. Right, let's stand across this room this morning. Come on. Oh, yeah. Everyone had a good Monday celebrating their freedom. Amen. I love fireworks. Who loves fireworks? I love blowing things up. It's, it's good. Who's warm in here this morning? Warm? Okay. So, good news. If you're warm and you're hot, the AC's broken. <laughs> so that means today you can go ahead and just break the ice with the person next to you and tell them we're going to worship and I'm going to sweat, okay? It's going to be part of it. And just so you know, when the beads of sweat start rolling down your back, you know where I'm going with this. It's just part of life. We're human. We sweat, okay? So I would recommend go ahead and hug the person next to you now because after worship, you're not going to want to do this, all right? Right. Everyone get your hug on. If you didn't hug somebody, God's watching. You are in the family of the Most High King right now, and you refuse to hug somebody. Some of you refuse to hug your spouse. That was weird. All right, do this with me. Let's stretch a hand towards heaven this morning. Across this room, just if you're comfortable with it, just put a hands up. This is our surrender moment, okay? Everyone say surrender moment. This is the moment you get to say, God, I surrender everything to you right now. In your own words, just say it. Just say, I surrender. Whatever that is, whatever that comes to your mind right now, just surrender it in the name of Jesus. So, Father God, I just surrender everything I am to you in this moment. God, my goal today is to worship you. I have no other agenda other than to just become undignified before your heavenly throne. God, I pray right now that the Holy Spirit would just invade hearts right now, would invade minds. Holy Spirit, have your way in this place. You are welcome here. We declare this morning that, God, this is your day. This is your moment. We get to come into this building and worship and proclaim how amazing you are. God, you will be praised in the highest mountain this morning. God, I pray that a fire would be set in the hearts of your people this morning. Jesus, you are worthy. You are worthy to be praised in this place. Hallelujah, Father. Hallelujah, Lord. Yeah, just worship him this morning, church. I just encourage you, just start your own song of worship right now. Yes, Lord God, praise your name, Jesus. We surrender everything to you, Lord, Father. Praise your name, Jesus. All right, if everyone's ready, say amen. Now, not amen, we're finished. Amen, we're ready to begin. Come on. Amen, it's just begun. Do you realize there's no finish line with God? The Bible says he's the beginning and the end, the alpha and the omega. He knows tomorrow before we even get there. There's no ending for him. He doesn't believe there's an ending for your life. Even if you're done on this earth... He's got other plans for you. Do you realize that? This whole reality that we get to go sit on gold thrones one day, how boring is that? I'm sorry. It's not going to be that fun. Uh, Newsflash. It might be fun for the first 30 seconds, but I'm ADD, so I'm like, Psh, I'm out of here. Listen, you are not done. You hear me? Somebody needs to hear that this morning. You are not finished. You want to know why you're not finished? Because you woke up with air in your lungs. See, God doesn't do things haphazardly. If there's air in, air in your lungs, there's purpose for you today. There's purpose for you tomorrow. All of you with kids, raise your hand, whether they're old, grown up or not. Listen, you are their best chance. You hear me? Parents in this house, you are the best chance your kids have at success. You are the best chance your kids have at learning how to worship Jesus. You are the best chance your kids have to succeed at work, 
to succeed as fathers and mothers, future generations. You are their best shot. The youth pastors are not gonna fix your kids. We have amazing youth ministry in this church, but listen, it's not their job to fix your kids. It's your job to parent your kids. It's their job to continue to push them towards Jesus. You hear me? Is this okay this morning? Sorry, they told me to be real and open. I told Laura, I said, that's dangerous. Listen, parents, it's not your parents' job to raise your kids either. You hear me? You had them. You had fun while having them. They are now your responsibility. Our first charge as parents is our kids. That's it. I had a parent come to me and said, I just cannot understand why my kid is doing fill in the blank. I just can't understand why he's going down this path. I can't understand why he's going, struggling with this. And I looked right at him because as he's telling me this, he's doing the very same thing that he can't understand why his kid is doing it. You guys hear me? A lot of times we get so narrow-minded on what we want and we want our kids to do, but we realize the fact that what our kids are doing is just replicating us. It's in our nature to replicate our fathers and mothers. Listen, church, it is in your nature to replicate Jesus. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. It is our job to manifest God's kingdom here on earth. You feel me yet? It is our job to make sure that if the angels are praising Jesus in heaven this morning, it's our job to make sure we're praising Jesus in this kingdom right now. It's our job to be like the angels going, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. That's our position this morning. It is our moment. Do not miss it. If you walk out of here without touching the throne of Jesus, that's on you. You hear me? I love you, but I'm tired of being fake. I'm tired of just pushing people off a cliff. If you want to experience Jesus today, it's your choice. If you want to feel the Holy Spirit today, that's your choice because he's here. I'm going. Lori's going. Lena's going. Nate's going. Gabe's going. These boys are ready. I can feel it. They, I can just, they're just like, give me Jesus. So let's do it this morning, okay? Everyone say amen. You guys still love me? All right, let's do this.
All right, before we go, what we're gonna do, before we continue going on this new song, I want you to find somebody in this church this morning. I'm gonna mix you all up one more time. Find somebody in this church this morning that you've never said hi to. You hear me? Somebody that you've never, do you realize there's people in here you've never talked to? <laughs> all of you are laughing because you're like, I already know. I want you to go find that person right now and I want you to tell them what you found in Jesus. Go. You're gonna go find a person you've never talked to before and you're gonna tell them what you found in Jesus. Come on, let's go. You got two minutes, which means your feet need to be moving. You too. <laughs> Oops. I just throw a number in at college and college. Average the last two weeks. All right, 30 seconds, counting down now. stand back to your feet. That was not permission to sit down. We're praising the king right now. Right. <laughs> How many actually found somebody they've never said hi to? How many actually did that? All of you get A's today. The rest of you? It's all good. We'll work on it. All right, let's worship this morning. Come on, let's go there together.
Who here would be this morning would say, you know, Casey, I heard you when you first started. I know I need to step up as a parent. I know I need to step up as a child. Who in this room would say, that's, that's really hard for me right now to step up? 
I just don't see a way. I don't see a way to connect with my kids. I don't see a way to connect with my wife. I don't see a way through the forest of misery that I've put myself in. Come on, who'd be honest in this room? Say, I don't see a way right now. I don't see a way. How many here don't see a way through the crisis our nation's facing right now? How many would be honest say, I really struggle with this right now? I'm looking at our national debt. I'm looking at our current leadership and I'm freaked out. Yeah, that's right. It's scary, right? Do you realize that God's not surprised by the moment you're in right now? He's not surprised by where our nation's at. He's actually looking at a greater victory because of where we're at. See, in order to have a victory, you have to have a valley, right? In order to have a mountaintop, there has to be a valley. If the world was flat for all of you flatlanders out there who think this world is flat, there has to be mountains and valleys. So it can't be flat, okay? Not to mention it looks like a blueberry from the moon. Blueberries are round. They're little round fruit. They're round, okay? It's not flat. Flat blueberry, no good. Probably ran over by something or stepped on, not good to eat. But what I'm saying is, listen, if you want to have the mountaintop experience with Jesus, you have to be willing to go through the valleys. Okay? It's not just this all mountaintop experience. When you ask Jesus into your heart, you're just like, I'm walking on water, I'm floating in the clouds. The truth is, if you never go to the valleys, you can never bring anybody with you out of them. There's purpose in your life. There's purpose in your, in your way as a father and as a mother and as a son and as a daughter and as of a grandparent. Listen, and as a business owner, you have to go through the valleys to know how great the hilltop and mountaintops are. Okay, anybody who's in here who are over 60 years old would attest, you have to go through experiences to have what we call wisdom. Okay, you can get knowledge from a book. You can read Genesis chapter 1 through Revelation. Okay, you can read the whole book. You can know it, but you will not have wisdom in it until you walk it. You hear me? You can read all the parenting books you want. I don't care who you are. If you're a new parent in this house, you think you have it figured out. I can say this because Brooke and I were there, okay? We're like, when we have our kids, they're going to be perfect. They're never going to poop. They're going to go to sleep on the perfect moment. And Iceland was that child. We thought we had it all figured out. And then life happens. And we realize we're raising a human being and we're responsible for her. Listen, you will not be able to gain wisdom until you experience it. How awesome is it going to be when we look back and we tell our grandkids and our great-grandkids, you should have seen where the United States was. You should have seen Jesus get a hold of our president of the United States. You should have seen when the Holy Spirit fell over the White House and everyone was praying to the Lord of God Almighty. Do you understand that in the book that we believe, that we are here today, do you realize in the end, we every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Do you realize that this morning? So I'm not worried about what Fox brings to my table. I don't care. I know what, who wrote the end of the book. I don't care what valley we got to go through to get there. We will have the wisdom and we will have the stories to rewrite eternity. Listen, church, we have the power to influence generations after generations after generations. It's not okay to sit here and say, well, God's coming back in two years. I'm just going to write it out and see what happens. No, listen, you don't know if you have two years or 200 years. I want to see a day when people live to 400 years old again. I want to live that long. You want to know why I want to live that long? Because I have purpose in my life. I don't want to give up. I don't want to stop. I want to run through the valley so when I get to the top, I can be like, look what we just went through. <laughs> Come on. Look what we went through. Impact Church has a story of this, right? Right, Pastor Jeremy? They look like this, right? You realize that this is a heart monitor? <laughs> We're living. Listen, if you're here and you don't see a way, you gotta understand that Jesus is the way maker. This song is not just about singing cool words that Jesus is the way maker. He is the way maker. And this song comes alive when you realize that 
who you're worshiping, who is actually rooting for you is the way maker. So you may not see a way, but he has a totally different perspective, church. Totally different perspective. So this morning, I'm going to ask you to do something. If you don't think there's a way, I'm going to ask you to ask God for his perspective through that moment. And then I want you to worship him like he's going to show you the way through. And one last thing I'll leave you with. You will never find the new way if you never take the first step. You hear me? You will never find a new path through the forest until you take the first step off the trail. So let's do that this morning. Let's do that as a church. Let's do that in worship. Let's step off of the existing trail that we know called insanity and let's jump into something new this morning. Do that with me. Let's do it.
of replanting some things right now and you know if I went and planted something and then I went out there two days later and didn't see anything oh man this is such a stupid garden stupid seeds nothing's happening nothing's growing that's not the way it works like even when I'm sleeping at night those seeds are starting to germinate and they're starting to do all the things that I don't even know how it works, but it works, that they start to grow. And I just feel like the Holy Spirit is saying that, you know, you may feel like you're in a season of waiting, the season where you plant and nothing is coming. And you go out there and check and nothing's coming, nothing's coming. But he's working even when we don't see it. Lord, I thank you that you are, <laughs> you are the God who works when we can't see. You are the God who works when we're not feeling it. You're the God that's working when we're sleeping. You're the God that's working when we're awake. You're the God that's working when we make a mistake. And you're the God that's working even when we do it right. But God, I thank you that you're always working. You're never not working on our behalf for our good, Lord. And we trust that. We trust your heart, God. Stop. 
I was standing over there on the end of the row, and I'm, I see a picture of someone, that, and I don't know why it's khaki shorts. I don't know all this, but khaki shorts about right here, a pair of sandals, and a T-shirt. And I looked up because in this picture, I see a great forest, and it's beautiful forest green. I mean, forest green is about the most awesome green I can ever imagine. But as I looked up and I saw the, I saw the forest green and, and, and the person in front of me, he's, he's kind of like walking like this. And he's got his hand out for, for whatever purpose. I wasn't sure. And when I looked up and I saw the incline of this mountain, and I just, I thought, I, I can't climb this. I, I, I'm old and I don't have the strength. And, you know, I was making all these excuses why I couldn't do it. And I kept seeing this person holding his hand out like this. Like, come on, you can do this. And as I got closer and I got steam up, you know, getting ready and and as the drummer over here started beating that drum, you know, in the, not this song, but the song before, I saw this person going like this, and he's going. And yeah. he kept getting closer to me. He kept saying, come on, you can do this. And I'm going, okay, okay. And I got louder, it got louder, it got louder. And, and you know when you walk on a dirty on a dirt trail how it'll kind of poof the dust around your footsteps there well I saw the dust going down and as he got closer started that incline and I saw it getting more steep more steep and I thought I, I can't do this and the forest was also in uniform everything every tree was all in line none was leaning this way or this way but straight in line it was so awesomely beautiful and i turned around again and jesus said it was jesus all along why he was in khaki shorts and sandals i don't know but you know wherever we're at in our walk with christ it will similar look like that and sometimes we get confused because we expect him to be in a white gown, you know, or a robe or whatever. And it's not always that way. But he'll be there at the moment that you're going to need it. And as he kept stomping up the trail like this, my strength got stronger. My body, my, my whole body was torso. Everything started straightening up instead of going like this, you know, running out of breath. And I... I kept saying, I don't know if I can do this. And he goes, you can do all things in me. And I said, let's go for it. And he grabbed me by the hand and he just, he didn't drag me, but it's like I got all of a sudden super jets behind me going, whoa, you know, going right along with him. So it, overall, I just feel like there's so many here that's been struggling in areas in your life and you're not sure what it, what it looks like, where it's going. All I can say is I've kept over and over and over hearing God, you be still and know that I'm God. Stop listening to the things of the, of the world. Stop listening to the lies. Stop listening to the confusion because this is just going to put you in a crippled state. And the thing is, is God, God will come to you exactly where you're at. And that, I mean, I wish I could, I could show you this picture of the forest and him being in khaki pants, you know, and sandals. And another thing was interesting, his hair was short and he had a lovely beard, you know. So, uh, God just wants to encourage you, don't give up because it looks rough and tough. But you can do all things, and he's preparing your path for you and for him for the things to come. And he says, don't give up.
Amen. I love how God speaks through so many different people the same story. Isn't it amazing? Alex, thanks for getting AC working. It hasn't caught up yet, but it's at least way better than it was. How many people would say, would be honest with me and say, you know, I am under attack. I am fighting a battle. I am getting hit by all sorts of things from all sorts of different directions. You guys, I want you to just know that every theme this morning was pick up your chin. Pick up your chin. Can I tell you something that's really interesting? I, I believe I'm sitting at five or six concussions in my lifetime. Um, I was that kid, right? How many parents have that kid? The one that you're like, can I just keep you out of the ER for at least one month, right? Um, I, I just, I was full on 100% of the time. Um, there's a reason why there's a nine year gap between me and my younger sister. My mom needed nine years of recovery. But one of the things one time that my doctor told me after, I don't know, remember which concussion, is he says, Jeremy, he goes, the concussions all happen on the back of your head. He says, you can take a huge amount of beating to the face without it causing problems. But he says, you keep finding a way to smack your brain stem, which gives you a concussion almost instantly. And at the time, that was just a little bit of information on my health. But what I find really interesting is this. He said, the best way to take any hit is to look it straight in the eye. To let it just hit you. Because he says, if you go down, he says it can, it can damage back here again because the impact will be low. He says, if you go up, it can be the same. He says, and if you take it from the back, the damage is there. How many times in life, whenever, whenever the enemy is just throwing punches, when the world's throwing punches, we have a tendency of wanting to turn around or we have a tendency of wanting to duck our heads? But I believe, I just really feel like, and I know it's kind of a wild analogy, but I feel like God's saying, hey, just take it. Just take the hit. Because let me say with confidence that what God has for you, you will never be able to understand the greatness that it is if you quit. We have this amazing ability to stand in a place of watching God do things beyond our wildest imagination if we just don't quit. Is it hard? Yes. Is it frustrating? Absolutely. Are there days where it's like, it'd be a lot easier to quit than to continue? Absolutely. But as we just heard, he's stomping up that hill going, hey, I got a hand for you. If you turn around, you'll never see what's on the other side. I'm a hunter. There's a lot of days that I'm at about I find that for me, mile 12 is where things get funky. That's my line for some reason. At mile 12, if I can push past 12, I got a 20-mile day under my belt. But a lot of times, 12 is where it's like, ah, it's hurting. It's not fun. Seems like for me, anytime I hit 12, I'm halfway up a mountain. But how many people know that if you never climb to the top, you never get to see what's on the other side? There's huge things on the other side, you guys. It's good. It's going to be amazing. Sorry, i got to shut this thing off. Turn her down a little. So if you're here today and you're like, man, I, just, I can relate to everything I heard this morning of, God, I just feel like I'm not making it. I, I'm not making the cut. Uh, I tried qualifying. I didn't make the qualification. I'm going to tell you right now that God's saying you qualify. You qualify. You made it. But it hurts. You're right. But you don't get any tenacity if it doesn't hurt. You don't get a steal to you if it doesn't hurt. You don't get to win if it doesn't hurt. If you win and it doesn't hurt, that means that you were in the wrong competition, folks. Life isn't going to be easy. But he also said he'd never leave you. So God, we come right now, and as this ties into what I'm preaching on this morning, as, as we get to see time and time again the fact that 
you know, the enemy doesn't want to see us succeed as people. He doesn't want us to see us succeed as Christians. He wants us to take and he wants us to be poor examples of Christianity to the world around us so that we make a poor example of Christ. But God, we're not losers. God, we are not put under. God, I am on the winning side. And my king doesn't know how to lose. And so God, right now, for every person who financially is struggling, every person whose marriage is on the rocks, every person whose job isn't working out, every person who's sitting there saying, God, I know you're true to your word, but I don't see it right now. God, I just pray that this morning, God, as you're orchestrating everything together and you're so good at doing this, you're sitting there saying, hey, I got you. Watch this. The best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen and amen. Thank you, worship team. Thanks for playing through the heat and everything else. It's a good morning, isn't it? Okay, a couple quick announcements. The This afternoon, we are going to be doing a baptism at 2 o'clock at Rock Lake. Currently, we have four people that have signed up. I don't know if they're all legitimate people because I'm realizing that this iPad kiosk is being used by our kids to sign up fictitious people with fictitious email accounts. This is my son's way of playing a joke on his father. So Joe Smith is going to be baptized today with an email address of more than wonderful at hotmail.com. That's my son's new alias. So he will be baptized again today in mud. No, it's, it's okay. I forgive you, as you can tell. No, but if you are interested, maybe you're like, I wasn't aware we're doing a baptism and I want to be baptized. 130 Rock Lake, we're going to go over that concept, make sure that we are all being baptized for the right reasons, and we're going to do a baptism at 2 o'clock. So what this requires is this. When people get baptized, we all show up. If you can be there, be there. Why? Because this is literally them saying, hey, this is, a, this is an outward sign of an inward change. I'm going under an old man, coming up a new man, and I get to celebrate that with my fam. How cool is that, right? And so best person to do it with is your family. Do it with your family, and we're the family. So 2 o'clock today, make sure you're there. If it's a situation where you're like, I really want to get baptized, and I didn't know that was an option, uh, definitely know that that is an option. You can be baptized today. We would love that, okay? So that's number one. Number two, the 40-day word fast books. If I could get some light in the back so I can feel like everyone's involved. Um, the 40-day word fast books. If you have a 40-day word fast book and you're done with it, um, I would ask that you would drop it off because we're going to continue to use these in studies we have a women's study starting on, on our Tuesday morning women's study. You're going to be going through the 40-day word fast. So if you have a book that you're done with, you're going to be coming close to the end of that 40-day window. Um, we're going to have a conversation on this at a breakout Sunday. We're just going to kind of keep this concept moving forward because how many people know life and death are in the power of the tongue? Best, best thing ever. Your mom said this. If you don't have anything good to say, don't. Whose mom didn't say that to you? No one, right? Because it's universal. Ellie, your mom didn't? I'll make sure she takes care of that. Kristen, use that this week with your daughter. Um, the truth, why do we say that? Because positivity and honor should come out of our mouths at all times, right? How many people know that we can speak things into existence or out of existence by the negativity or positivity of what we speak, right? That marriage will never work. You're right. Congrats, you just put the nail in it. You know what, I'm always going to be sick. You're right, you always will be. You know what, I'll never be able to get along with so-and-so. You're right, you never will. I'm never going to be successful. Congratulations, you just set out your path. You don't believe it? Just look at history. It, it's, it, it holds true. People who start saying those things, that becomes who they are. So, 
If you have not read the 40-Day Word Fest, get your hands on a book. If you're done with the book at this point and you want it to just kind of circulate through the library here at the church, right out here in this parcels box, just drop your book. We'll get them collected. We'll continue to get those circulated. But let's be a church that is honoring in our speech, upholding in our, in our vocabulary and how we put people together. Can we do that? together. And the actual term is brothers in Christ. Uh, There is a movement across the nation for brothers to come together and sisters to come together and people to come together and say, hey, denominational lines probably don't matter. Let me rephrase that. Denominational lines don't matter. There, it, it, there's, there's a, if we can understand that it's Christ and him crucified, if we have that fundamentals, foundational faith, the same, we can overlook our differences and realize that we all have one goal, and that is to see the gospel of Jesus Christ transform the world. That's our job, okay? So let's make sure, uh, men of the church, if you don't have anything going on Thursday night, be here 7 o'clock. If you do have something going on, cancel it. Be here 7 o'clock. Because we really want men to be here, to come together and to unify, I've got an event that is going on in September that we're going to announce at that same, that is this, this heart and concept, something we can do together and try to get the community involved with. So, anyways, thank you. Kids, you are dismissed Impact Kids Church. Get our kiddos out. So, if you have your scriptures, let's turn to Luke 1. And if anyone is very well versed on their scriptures, they're like, Luke 1 is, a, is more something that we talk about in, at Christmas time and not so much in July. But it is Christmas in July. No, it isn't. Um, but this is where I was at a quiet time this last week. How many people... How many people understand that God cares way less about your organization and way more about what he's speaking on? Right? So God is sitting there saying, hey, that's a great sermon that you're not going to get to preach. And so last, literally last night, I was telling Lori, I'm like, I got two sermons prepped. And neither one's right. And I'm like, what should I do? And we kind of, we hashed over these two concepts. And one of which she's like, I think you already preached on that. Can't do that. I'm like, oh, okay. The second one is something that will come out. It's something that needs to come out. It's talking about honor and relationships, kind of what I just spoke on a little bit, but it's in-depth. How do we honor in relationships and build relationships up through honor? But then I was sitting there, and, and I was like, God, what do you really have? I put on some, some soaking music, and I just was like, God, give me your heart for today because obviously what I thought it was either shifted changed or I didn't listen, one or the other. And so I was going through, what I do is when I'm doing my quiet time and God gives me zingers, I write them down because if I start prepping a sermon right then, I don't finish my quiet time. So what I do is I have a notes on my phone of just those things, those concepts. Sometimes it's a verse, sometimes it's a word, sometimes it's a concept. So this morning, we are going to look at Luke 1 and, and what I was reading in my quiet time was when the angel came to Mary. We all know the story. Mary, a young girl, we don't know, 14 to 16 years of age, they think, maybe 12 to 16 years of age. And all of a sudden, this um, angel says, hey, by the way, you're going to give birth to the Christ, to Jesus. And she goes, wait a second. I'm a virgin. How can I? I? It doesn't work. It doesn't work. God, maybe you don't understand how this whole thing works. I mean, this doesn't work. And so if we read, uh, I'm going to start in, in 35. Um, after she says, how, how will this be? I'm a virgin. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, 
uh, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who uh, was to be barren is in her sixth month of pregnancy. And then verse 37, for nothing is impossible with God. And so I had one verse that just, it, it jumped off the page, and I've read it probably a hundred times, but this time when I read it, it meant a lot different or a lot of different things to me. And so we are going to look at Luke 137, for nothing is impossible with God. And so what I do normally when this happens is I start looking at different translations and start cross-referencing and I start dissecting a scripture. And this is what I found very interesting. This scripture is controversial. Not the concept of it, but the translation of it. And let me explain why it is. So I looked... And I just started finding a lot of discrepancies in how it was written out. So Luke one thirty seven in another translation says, For no word from God will ever fail. Let me say it again. For no word from God will ever fail. Let's keep that in the back of our minds. And then it, I looked further and it says, For nothing will be impossible with God. So here it says, For nothing is but here it says, for nothing will be. And so I started looking into the Greek, and you're like, oh, I just lost everyone right there. I saw it. Stay with me. I started looking into the Greek, and I started realizing that the Greek didn't translate into English properly for this verse. It didn't read correctly. But what they're talking about is more than just this concept of nothing is impossible for God. I agree, nothing is impossible for God. But let's actually break this down in a couple different ways. Number one, for nothing, absolutely nothing is impossible for our God. Is that correct? Absolutely. There was only one thing that he wouldn't do, and that was blindly forgive the sins of man. But instead, he sent his son to die on a cross for you so that he could bridge that gap and once again reestablish the fact that there is nothing impossible for God. He just had to do the workaround of Jesus Christ to make it reality. Why? Because in that place, you can then be forgiven instead of just overlooked. I'll say that again. You can be forgiven instead of just overlooked. How many people in this place like to have when someone goes, well, what you did was wrong, but I guess I'll forgive you? Or is it a situation where you want our Father in heaven to sit there and go, hey, you're cleansed. I don't even see that on you anymore because all I see is the righteousness of Christ upon you. See the difference? One's an atonement. One's a forgiveness. One is just maybe we can get there. The other is you're completely forgiven. So for nothing is impossible with God, right? For nothing, absolutely nothing. But then the second is this. When I read it in my scriptures here, it says, for nothing is impossible with God. But as I started dissecting it, I saw a different phrase, and that was, will be. What does that, what does that actually do? It's interesting here, the angels use the word will be rather than is. It's actually showing that there's much to do. There's much to still be done. God is still doing. God is still increasing. God is still breaking through. You need to understand that this is incredible for us to understand that there is things, there's chapters yet to be written by us, the church. There's chapters yet to be written by God. He's not saying, never mind, it's, it's finished, it's over. No, he's like, hey, this is the work of the gospel that continues and continues and continues. It was 2,000 years ago at a cross that it started, and it won't end until the day he returns. Casey made a statement that I really liked. When I was about 17 years old or 16 years old, I began to realize something that was going on in the church. It was a cancer. If someone in the room today had stage four terminal cancer with a death date already written, would you go and try find help? Yeah. You'd be like, we need to fix this. My dad had a friend, a high school friend. They were on their way. They were getting ready to go to a trip to Hawaii as, as a couple. He went in because he had an elbow that was hurting, and they found out by a blood test that he had very crazy advanced leukemia. 
And he's like, well, can we start treatment after I get back from Hawaii? They're like, you won't get back from Hawaii if we don't start treatment now because your blood cultures and your blood uh, work is, is so out of whack. And so they started immediate treatment. Why? Because they knew there was a problem. They knew there needed to be a solution. And so one of the things that I think we need to understand here is that we have a problem. Every person on this planet has a problem without Christ, right? We need to understand that this concept for nothing is impossible with God. We need to understand that the first thing is us. The first thing is us. You're not impossible for God. You have a problem. You have a condition. You're terminal. But nothing is impossible with God. If you don't believe that, then you will always be at a place of going, I'm not good enough. But God doesn't know what I did. Really? You, you honestly think that you somehow surprised God? You honestly think that your lifestyle somehow surprised the Almighty? You think that somehow you've achieved some level of, of failure that no longer can be saved? Quite the contrary. For nothing is impossible with God. So for nothing will be impossible. And then the end is not for God. The proper translation is with God. If it would have said for God, that means that God does all the work. But with God has a whole lot different context. It actually brings you into the equation. How many people understand that this divine opportunity we have with God requires you to engage? So growing up in the church, sorry, all that was a smoke screen because I forgot where I was going. It was good. Growing up in the church, there was something that I found as a cancer in the church. That's where I was. Remember that? And that was a thing called end times pessimism. Does anyone know what end times pessimism is? Pastor Jim, what's end times pessimism? What's your heart on end times pessimism? Excuse? That's perfect. It's an excuse. It's an excuse to do what? Nothing. Oh, well, Jesus is coming soon. I had an individual yesterday who's like, I just, I can't wait for the return of the Lord. I can't either. Which also means I can't wait for the return of the Lord. There's work to be done. But the end times pessimism says, hey, it's too far gone. Just stay clear of it. Stay in your church. It's a safe place. And Casey said, you know, we don't know if God's coming back in two weeks or 200 years, but you better believe we work like he's coming back tomorrow today. And this is, this is what I really want. You ready for it? And this is going to bend some people's minds. I don't want God to come back. And this is why. Because I'm not done working yet. Because there's work to be done. If, if, if it was a situation where your boss said, hey, Jeremy, I need you to get this, 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 and this accomplished today. And you're about at the end of the day, you're like, day's almost over. Nothing more to do today. I didn't get anything accomplished I was told to. But at least the day's almost over. It doesn't matter now. No, instead it'd be a situation of, this is my personality, if I had a list if God said, Jeremy, you need to do this, the church of the United States, the church of the, of the world needs to accomplish this, 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 and this, and they need to do it before I return, then I would sit there and go, hey, it's nine at night, but we're still working. Why? Because there's work to be done. I don't want him to come back. Why? Hey, you know what? I'm going to shoot a text and say, hey, don't come back tomorrow. We're not yet finished. I want you to come back for a spotless bride ready to be brought in as, as the pure and spotless bride that you intended. I don't want a church that's gone halfway that hasn't accomplished what it was meant to accomplish because guess what? His, the for nothing will be impossible with God. 
We need to partner with the Almighty and do what He called us to do. If we don't do that, you failed. I think there's actually some parables on that. Maybe some talents, a couple that got buried, a couple that got invested. I think the ones that got buried were given to the ones that invested. But instead, the church has gone, hey, it's really messed up. I can't believe how bad this world looks. Let's just hunker down and hold out, and maybe we can make it. Why don't you blow the doors off the place and see what God has for it? Because at the end of the day, I don't want God to return until I can look back on my life, when I can look back on the life of the church and say, hey, we did our job. God, come back, man. We, we did our job. The church across the world has risen up and said, hey, we got something to live for worth dying for. We've got truth that you can't have outside of Christ. And we, we were able to change the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is what we were called to do in, in, in Matthew 28. We did it. Come on back. Let's go for next assignment. But instead, we sit there and go, oh, it's too far gone. We can't do this. You know what? It won't happen. With God. Mine says for God, but as you actually, no, mine does say with God. But as I've been looking at it, there are some that actually say for God. But if you look at the original translation, it wasn't for God. It was with God. Of course, God can do all things But here we are to perhaps understand that with him we can actually be a part. I don't know about you, but I don't want to come and watch you work. I want to come work with you. I want to be the one that goes, hey, show me those plans again. Where does that wall go? How, how many feet from there to there? Okay, and we got to take out, we got to take out a half an inch for drywall, but we're going to take five outs for a firewall. Okay, so. Do you see what I'm saying? I want to be part of the plan. Don't tell me, hey, stand on the sidelines and watch me work. God didn't do that. Moses, step in and see the water part, right? Do you think Moses was like, God, though everyone's watching me, what happens if it doesn't part? I'm going to look like an idiot. Hey, why don't you have all the priests walk in with the Ark of the Covenant in flood stage? You're going to send your most valuable article into a flood river. Let's just think about this, right? But God's like, no, you got to partner with me. You got to do it. You do it, then I do it. Casey said it, take the first step. If you don't take the first step, then don't expect God to take the next step. So often we're like, I would have done it if God would have showed up. Did you show up? Because if you didn't show up, why should he show up? You're the one who was called to do it. Of course, his power is going to be how you can do it. But if you don't show up, then you can't be mad. Because you didn't show up. So as I was reading this about a young girl who was saying, hey, how can I be pregnant? For nothing will be impossible with God. I'm going to go to that other translation for no word from God will ever fail. When I read that one, I was like, what? Can I tell you something that's so incredibly cool about that? And, and I actually looked into the translation. Either one of these could be used in this context. But how many people have had a word from God? They, a promise from God. You know it to be true, right? God, God told me this. He told me that my kids were going to come back to him. He told me that My marriage was going to succeed. He told me that, you know what, the business was going to work. For no word from God will ever fail. Take him to the bank, folks. If God said it, he's going to do it. If Scripture says it, he's going to do it. It's impossible for him to go back on it. It's against his nature. In Genesis 18, 14, it says, Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Sarah was 90. She laughed. God goes, <laughs> don't laugh. Watch me work. 
hey, you know what? I want to see every person in Platte County come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. People go, what? They laugh. Don't laugh. Because you don't know my God. I want to see America more firmly established in biblical principles than when our founding fathers established this country. Can we do that? Totally. We laugh. Why? Because we see the outcome of what what the last 50 years have done. But I will tell you this. The last 50 years didn't have the church waking up. The last 50 years wasn't the church going, hey, I've got something in here that's working. I've got something in here that's saying, hey, guess what? I'm going to move and the Almighty is going to come. Because he said, hey, Jeremy, jump into this. I'm going to say, okay, God, I'm going. And he's like, watch, watch this, watch this. Boom, you jump. Now I can work. When I say the word Jehovah Rapha, what does that mean? Anyone know what Jehovah Rapha means? God, our healer. God, our healer. So Jehovah Rapha, one of the things, if, you ever, if you've never done a study on the names of God, do it. It's radical. It's cool stuff, right? Uh, we, have, we have one name for, for in this Western context and culture. They have many names in their culture. So Jehovah Rapha means healer or God, our healer. So Abraham's wife was barren, right? We see this here in, in Genesis 18, 14. Hey, you're going to have a kid. I'm 90. How am I going to have a kid, right? Because Jehovah Rapha said so. Because Jehovah Rapha said so. Five centuries later, he still healed the snake-bitten Israelites that were in the wilderness. 1,500 years after that, He was still healing when we see the Gospels and Acts, right? 2,000 years later, he still heals today. Why? Because in the span of 4,000 years from Abraham to now, God's promises haven't changed. His nature hasn't changed. I struggle with any theology who says, oh, that was then, this is now. That means that my God is different then than now. If anything, it should be a situation of that wasn't possible then, but it's possible now because the God that I serve is only increasing as our faith increases. Why? Because his ability to move is greater and greater and greater because all along he's like, that's what I wanted to do, but they weren't ready for it, but you're ready for it because you've seen it. See the difference? We are 4,000 years down the road from the first healing that we see in Scripture to today. And guess what? The promises in the Bible have been thoroughly tested, thoroughly proven, and found to be trustworthy. As Exodus 3 opens, God appears to Moses in a burning bush, a cool story. We hear it in our Sunday schools, and and it's something that we always talk about. God, send a burning bush. The only reason we got a burning bush is because Moses was deaf. That guy couldn't figure it out. God is like, I've been telling you to go back and free my people, but I guess I'm going to have to send a bush to do it, right? And then what, what ensues is probably one of the most amazing conversations Moses actually talked to God more than any other person in the Old Testament. You do realize that, right? Direct conversations with God. Moses should have been a shriveled up fried prune somewhere for all the times that him and God had conversations that he disagreed with God, right? And so the bush starts talking in Exodus 3, and he asks a question. Suppose I do go to the Israelites, which is so funny. Suppose I do. God just told you to go, and you're like, well, suppose I do. Moses, what do I say to them? The God of our fathers has sent me to you, and they asked me, what is his name? What then shall I tell them? When Moses asked God his name, he's not asking God what he should call him. He's asking God, who are you really? Who are you? Right? And God answered him this. You ready for it? I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent you. When Moses asked God his name, 
who he really is, God replies, I am who I am. God's foundational promise to Moses, to his people in Egypt, and to his people across time and space is that he's unchangingly, unstoppably himself. God doesn't change who he is. I am who I am. You know, I'm in politics now. That is the farthest thing from I am who I am. Right? I've had conversations with people. I walk out of that office and I'm like, they're going to do the right thing. And then the news release comes out two days later. You're like, what? That's not what you told me two days ago in your office. Why? Because it's a lot easier to tell me what I want to hear. It's a lot easier to tell your spouse or your boss or your coworker or whoever what they want to hear so you don't cause waves in the moment. But God is unceasingly who he is. He never changes. His nature is true. In this moment, God is revealing that he is unchanging and unstoppable. I will be who I've always been, and I'll be that for the rest of eternity. i got to put a side note in because I have a moment, and then we're going to do communion. After he says, I am who I am, I am the the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Which is really interesting, isn't it? Because Abraham was the new name for Abram. Isaac didn't get a name change, but Jacob did. So why didn't he say, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel? Isn't it interesting that God chose to talk about the one that we aren't proud about. He says, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and the deceiver. Why? Because he's God of all your problems, just like your breakthroughs. God will claim you even in the problems and in the breakthroughs. So don't ever underestimate the fact that God is sitting there going, hey, I'll take you just as you are. Malachi 3, 6 said, I'm the Lord and I do not change. So you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Hebrews 13, 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And finally, James 1, 17 says, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. Today, I I started out by saying, hey, how many people are under an attack, right? Like, I've got a cheat sheet to the attack chart of impact because I get the phone calls. Pastor Jim and I and Pastor Shirley, we know when there's an attack. Why? Because we get the phone calls. And whenever it's like, hey, it's interesting, marriages are under attack right now. That's the flavor of the month, right? It is. Pastor Hannah, you get what I'm saying. Why? Because the enemy's not too original. He usually doesn't attack on more than one or two fronts. Marriages are the attack right now. Family structure is the attack. Fear is the tool he's using. Right? That's how he's working right now. And I want you to today, for whoever's here that needs to hear this, is if I could have my... Deacons, come forward and start uh, passing out communion. I feel like God wants you to know today that his word is true. That he's holding true to who he is. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen? He will not change. You don't have to worry about the change. The breakthrough is coming. John, I'm going to, anyone who needs gluten-free bread, John will have it. Gluten-free. Raise your hand if you need gluten-free. We got a couple over here. Or one. Okay, gluten-free. The last thing we want to do is hurt you with communion. So God is sitting here in this moment saying, hey, you know what? I haven't changed. The promises I gave you are true. The breakthrough that is coming, it's still coming. 
You guys, have we ever... I, I'm, I'm standing in this point, and I used to always say, I wish I was born in a different era. I'm kind of a throwback. I love history. I love the simplicity of it. How many people understand? I remember as a kid going hunting with my dad and never having a cell phone. And you'd leave for a week. And mom didn't know if you made it. Mom didn't know if you had enough food. Mom didn't know. Mom didn't know. Mom, mom figured it out, right? And at the end of the week, you would crawl off the mountain with whatever th- you had left, and, and you'd come home, and, and then they'd see you. And if you didn't show up on Friday when you said you'd show up on Friday, then they said, oh, something must have happened. Now we can actually be concerned. No one was concerned until Friday. If you don't make the phone call within 15 minutes of your allotted arrival time, everyone's like, oh, no, they died. I mean, it had to freak out. And so we live in this world where our lives are being manipulated and maintained and, and coerced and ran by this little box that sits in my pocket. So a part of me is like, man, I wish I grew up in an era where that wasn't a thing. I heard it this morning. You used to check, who was it? Dave said it. You used to get home and check the messages on the machine, right? Or, and some of you are like, what machine? This is how my phone worked. Or better yet, I picked it up and I asked the person to push the button. They're like, connect me, operator, party line, right? Time changes. And I've always said, I wish I was born in a different time, in a different era, where my vehicle could have been a 69 Camaro or something of that nature. But God told me the other, or Mopar, I drive a Challenger, bro. I'm not, I'm man enough for that. But then God said, Jeremy, I intended you to be born for the very time and place you were born. Why? Because I created in you the solutions to the problems the world has. This is the most exciting time in the world to be alive, you guys. Like, you want to talk about the biggest breakthroughs? We will tell our kids about these times. These are going to be Moses at the edge of the Red Sea moments, you guys. The breakthroughs that we are going to see in this time and space are going to be so much greater than anything we could have ever even thought of or imagined. Why? Because God is priming the pump for the greatest movement of him this world has ever seen. Why? Because he's true to his word. Because he doesn't change. Because God says, hey, the gospel of 2,000 years ago is the gospel of today. It hasn't changed. The church has done its level best to screw it up. But I believe there's a, there's a simplicity and a... Thank you, brother. I'm going to take that one so I don't spill it everywhere. I did. I told you I'd drive a challenger. I'm down. Dude, if you, you get me any Dodge muscle car from the 60s, I will gladly drive it and my, find a space in the garage for it. You, you give me. No. I said, I will find a spot in the garage for it. I will dr- Dude, I'll drive it. I'll drive it. It might get a bow tie somehow injected into it, but I'll drive it. There was a massive lack of Mopar power at that car show yesterday. Come on. You got to fix that. God isn't changing. He isn't. And so what I want you to know today is this. The enemy will tell you, you didn't hear right. That, isn't, that wasn't God's voice. Marriage works for them, but it won't work for you. Health, you can't have health. Someone else gets health, you don't get health. You're the exception. Breakthrough, you don't get to have breakthrough. That you're the exception. Those are lies. That's fear speaking. You know, we live in a world today where the enemy is doing his level best to silence the church through so many different avenues. Original, no, not really, but so many different avenues. And this morning, as it started in worship and it's going to this point, the God I serve doesn't change, and his promises are true. Your breakthrough's coming. Collectively, our breakthrough's coming. 
Look around, you guys. There's people waking up like I've never seen before. When the worship team quits, but the song keeps going. Why? Because people aren't concerned about going through the motions anymore. There's a tenacity and a hunger that I'm seeing out of people that's like, I don't get it, but I love it. What shifted? I had a pastor who told me they're like, their church is dying after COVID, like literally shriveling up and dying. And I said, what stance did you take through COVID? Well, what do you mean? I said, did you stand on the fact that truth was going to be what prevailed and that we trusted in the Lord? Or was it very much a fear-based approach to it? And this guy looked at me and he goes, well, we, we abided by all the statutes and rules. And I said, okay. I said, the government shall not infringe upon any house of worship. So I abided by all statutes and rules too. But the thing you need to understand is I saw so much growth come out of COVID because I saw people wake up. Other people had quite the opposite. Why? Because if it isn't a real relationship with Jesus Christ, then something like COVID will whittle it away. Your promises you'll change out for the security that a government can give you. Maybe I'll say that one again. Your promises you'll change out for a security that the government will give you. You guys, I fully stand underneath the authority of the United States, but my citizenship is in heaven. And, and with that comes the responsibility to do so much more than, than just abide. Promises. Jesus Christ came to give what? Life. And life more abundant. And so what I think was really interesting is when Jesus Christ was on a cross or in that moments before he went on the cross is he brought his disciples together for communion and he, and he sat down and he said, hey guys, this is, this is so much more than just a Passover meal. This is my life being broken for you. And he said, so just stop the ritual is what I really felt like God was doing. Because you have to understand, how many people have ever been to a Sadar? They're very ritualistic. They have a script that is read. It's actually memorized by the head of the home. And, I'm, and please hear me right. I'm not coming down on it. But this is what Jesus did. He goes, stop. I'm, I'm pausing the script. Because this isn't ritualistic. This is relational based. He says, the, the fact that I'm going to a cross to die for you, don't forget that. Don't get stop, stuck in the rituals. Continue in the relationship. And so Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread and he broke it. And he said, guys, this is my body which is broken for you. And you need to take this in remembrance of me. Don't ever forget that there was a broken body at a cross. Don't ever forget what it cost to buy your freedom. We were slaves in chains until that day. You're slaves in chains until the day you wake up and say, God, you're worthy. And I need you to be the Lord of my life. You're slaves in chains until the day you, you sign the title over and make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. But that day is a day of celebration. That day is a day where we can then say, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So, God, I just thank you for a broken body, a body that didn't need to break. But it broke because you said, I don't want it to be a situation where they just have an atonement. I want them to have a restoration. I want to restore my children. And so, God, sin is a very real part of our lives, God, until the moment we sit there and say, God, the blood of Jesus Christ needs to be the cleansing power in my life. God, we need to change the focus. Does it negate the fact that we have a sin nature? Nah. But all of a sudden, the sin nature isn't our focus anymore. It's the righteousness of Christ. So God, as we hold a, a representation of your broken body today, God, let us sit here and celebrate the fact that we are lo not lost anymore, but we're found. We're free, and we are 
truly sons and daughters of a king. We thank you and praise you now in Jesus' name, amen. Let's partake. Scripture says, in the same way after supper, he took the cup and said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Whenever you drink it, do it in remembrance of me. All these Jewish boys go, new covenant? They sat through the rabbi's teaching about Abraham's covenant. Well, Adam's covenant, Abraham's covenant, Moses' covenant. And he's like, wait a second, new covenant? Another one coming? We've had, we've had three years of hearing, hearing your crazy heresies because that's what Jesus spoke. Religious leaders of the day couldn't handle it. And they're like, wait a second, what's this? You want to know what the new covenant did? It fulfilled the others. It fulfilled them. He says, hey, guess what? It's a new covenant of freedom. Because who the Son sets free is free indeed. It's the law of love. What? Love. Not a 60s slogan, guys. This isn't enlightenment. This is freedom. See the difference? He says, hey, I got a new covenant. You guys want to be a part of that? Oh, make sure everyone else gets to be a part of it too. Why? Because everyone's equal now. What? Equality in Christ? Yeah. Can we just say right now that in Christ should be zero bigotry? In Christ should be zero racial tension? In Christ there should be zero financial line? In Christ there should be zero spiritual line? Oh, you've been saved six months? You've been saved 60 years? Cool. You guys are both saved. Let's roll. Hey, six months. Go inject some of that fire in 60 years. 60 years. Go inject some of that wisdom in six months. Let's go kill this thing. Right? That's how the kingdom works. No. Well, after 10 years of faithfulness, then we'll consider a Sunday school teacher position. Well, don't worry. You'll kill any fire they had by then. New covenant, covenant of love, a covenant of freedom in Christ. It says, hey, why don't you take this and transform lives with it? My blood will transform lives, literally and figuratively. God, I thank you for the shed blood of Jesus, the blood shed on a cross that was given for us. And God, we just pray blessings now over every single one in this place, God, as we partake together and we say, God, you know what? I want to be a part of this. God, I'm just, I'm sensing this overwhelming call to action that you're saying, hey, it's time. Hey, it's time. God, last week, as, as I, I spoke that word, God, it, we're at a point where America is desperate for the church. America is desperate for truth. America is desperate for us, the body of Christ, to sit there and go, hey, guess what? I'm not going to be defined anymore by what the world calls me. I'm going to be defined by what you call me. So, God, as you brought a new covenant, let us walk in that new covenant. Let us shine that to the world around us, all the while not compromising truth. We thank you and praise you now. In Jesus' name, amen. Today, as we walk out of this, I want you to take and start changing your paradigm. I said it, life and death are in the power of the tongue. So if life and death are in the power of the tongue, this is what I want you to start saying to yourself. Things along this line, this is the best job I've ever had. What, you hate your job? I didn't, I didn't ask if you hated your job. This is the best job I've ever had. Why? Because this is where God's placed me for this time in this place, right? You know what? I have the most amazing marriage ever. What? Your, your marriage is on the rocks. It is? I have the most amazing marriage ever. You know what? My kids are going to be world changers. Your kids can't string two sentences together and they're freaking not even following Christ. That doesn't matter. Start speaking the life into them. You know what? If it's a situation where your health, if you keep seeing the, the, the breakdown of your body, sit there and look in the mirror every morning and say, I am healthy and whole. I am, I am called to be perfect because God created me perfect. I don't see cancer anymore. I don't see diabetes anymore. I don't see 
whatever it may be, whenever you sit there and go, you know what, and and this requires action on your part as well, but the point is start speaking life back into who you are. Sit there and go, these are the promises that God gave me. Write them down and claim them every morning. Why? Because God is saying life and death is in the power of the tongue, and I don't change. Start making the reality out of it. Hey, America is going to be a great nation. I'm going to write it down, and I'm going to say it. We're going to have more conservative justices. I'm going to write it down, and I'm going to say it. We're going to see a landslide 2022 in the election process. I'm going to write it down and say it. You know what? We're going to see tax reform in this nation where we're going to get away from being a nation that is completely and utterly controlled by debt, and we're going to see breakthrough. I'm going to speak it, and I'm going to say it. Why? Because we have power in our tongue. Can I be honest with you guys? I've heard way more people tell me how bad America is and how, how much we're going down the drain than tell me how good we are and what we're going to actually see accomplished. Why? Because that's what we do. So I'm just challenging you. Change, shift it. Let's shift that paradigm. Let's start speaking life into the areas of our life that we don't see it yet, but we know that it's coming. Can we do that? God, I thank you for this group of amazing people. God, I thank you for AC. God, I thank you for all of the things that we hold dear in this 21st century. God, I pray that we would allow the things to slip that are not of you. We would allow the things that are of you to boister in our lives, God, and we'd start holding you at your word, at your promises, and understanding that you are truly who you are because of who you are. And God, I pray that we would speak that, we would declare that, We would start speaking life into everything around us, and we would see the breakthroughs that you have for us. God, I thank you for this nation, a nation I get to be a part of. God, I thank you for her government. And God, I thank you that it was founded on biblical principles, and I thank you that we're going back to those biblical principles. God, I thank you for the breakthroughs that you're bringing in this nation in 2022. God, I thank you for the moral uh, turnaround, the moral... just revival that is going to break out across this nation, God, as the church reforms the broken and dark places of this land. God, I thank you for the elected individuals that are going to truly represent people, their people, and the voice of their people. God, I thank you for the truth that is going to be spoken from the media mountain, God, as we quit seeing lies spoken over us and we start seeing truth being brought forward, God. I thank you for the hard times that are going to make us into what you intended us to be. And God, I thank you for the greatest move of you that this world's ever seen and the greatest harvest of souls that we've ever witnessed. God, I thank you for the those things. And as we walk forward into 2022, God, I pray that we would understand that we are the key part to making all that happen. And as we do that, God, I pray that we would be the ones writing history books and saying, for such a time as this, I was placed on this earth and I will change and shift the atmosphere around me. We thank you and praise you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen. Okay. So this is what I want. If you are wanting to be baptized, I want you to just, I'll be right out here by the door. Just catch me, and I'm going to make sure that we know exactly what we're doing. How many people signed up for baptism that are here? I'm seeing one, two, is that two? Okay, just find me right out here afterwards. If you're wanting to be baptized, come find me, and uh, I would love to be able to just kind of introduce what that looks like. Um, and then my day is a little crazy. So what we're going to do is we're going to do one thirty to two baptism. And then I've got one meeting afterwards we're going to hit, and then we've got to get to Casper. So, uh, we're going to keep the day moving. Sound good guys. Well, I actually have a legislative reception I have to be at. So, (laughs) well, okay. God bless you guys. Thank you. And I'll talk to you soon. Hallelujah.